And next, we're going to learn about the spirit of the prosperous future. And we are having and welcome the director of the Science and Technology Center for Phosphorus Sustainability Steps Center, um, Jacob Jones, who you may have seen yesterday around, uh, will uh, feature what we're working in terms of the present and the future and what we consider and uh, um, call it the 25 in 25. So you will learn soon what 25 in 25 is, but it's all about our future and our generation, next generation. So let me tell you who is Jacob. Jacob Jones is a Kobe Distinguished Professor of Material Science and Engineering at NC State. Um, he is also the director of the Research Triangle Nanotechnology Network, RTNN, um, a site, again, NSF, that supports nanotechnology and um, infrastructure. So he's doing a lot for um, workforce development, he's doing a lot for diversity and inclusion, he's doing amazing in terms of research, and he's uh, here to provide a lot of opportunity and always looking forward to bringing the highest state of the art infrastructure so that our student can be navigating in a very exciting space. And so with that, I introduce Jacob to the podium. Thank you, Ross. Is that the title slide? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. The one on the left is the title slide. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. It's a privilege and an honor. Um, I just need to put it out there. I was given this title. I did not make up this title. I cannot predict the future. If I could, I would have stopped on the way in and purchased a Powerball ticket. So if any of you can predict the future, just a reminder that we accept charitable donations that go toward phosphorus sustainability research. So remember that when you wake up tomorrow and check the numbers. Um, but uh, in any case, I was uh, asked to come here and talk about Phosphorus Future, which relates in part to what we're uh, trying to pioneer through STEPS. And so really what I want to tell you about today, because some of you have not yet been introduced to STEPS, is introduce STEPS to you. But I think more importantly is show you how we made a compelling case to the National Science Foundation through a very collective and rigorous effort of defining the problem. And I think that helps set the stage for what's going to come as an activity today, which is through STEPS, we are pioneering a US-centric roadmap that's informed by global stakeholders. Um, and so you're going to participate in that process today. So um, I'm first going to tell you a, a welcome from STEPS. I don't think you've had that yet. Um, maybe you've been welcome to Raleigh and welcome to the SPAP forum, but I want to welcome you to STEPS. We're going to talk about the wicked problem of phosphorus sustainability and the way that we pitched it and help define the center, uh, dive deep into part three of the STEPS Convergence Research Center, and then in part four, uh, tee up this discussion on the road mapping process and your involvement in that. Um, so yeah, welcome from STEPS. Uh, what you'll see in, in a, a subsequent slide is our focus on what we call triple bottom line scenario sites, which are specific geographical areas that we can study phosphorus flows. And I love this picture. So you're in the Sheraton, which is in the upper right somewhere. That's downtown Raleigh. But we're in very close proximity to farms. So this is an experimental NC State farm that's only a couple miles away, as well as uh, aquatic systems. And so we think in STEPS, obviously, about the phosphorus flows in these types of systems. So STEPS is a uh, partnership between 10 different institutions. NC State is the lead, but we have very important partners that are scattered throughout the uh, US. Um, it's a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center. I'll define that for you uh, a little bit later. And it's located, the headquarters is located in the new plant sciences building at NC State, which you will see on Thursday at the poster session. Um, so it's a very exciting time to be part of what's going on within that culture at NC State, very synergistic interdisciplinary culture. Um, in one sentence, steps can be said, to be a convergence research center with phosphorus sustainability as the vehicle. And we love this statement. This was actually said by a reviewer, and we picked it up and we ran with it. Um, and we love this because it describes the process that we use to go about our research, which is through convergence research, and also the target of our study, which is phosphorus sustainability, both important aspects to STEPS. 
So the wicked problem of phosphorus sustainability, Jim described this very well through a 45 minute presentation and I don't mean to dwell on it. I just wanna show one slide showing the linearity of the system, at least from the US perspective, how we mostly handle this today. So mining from non-renewable resources, it being an essential element, but also a pollutant, uh, very little entering our diet. And then obviously the, the consequences downstream of freshwater eutrophication and harmful algal blooms. And over the course of the last 10 years, as you saw in some of Jim's plots, we've increased our dependence on phosphates tenfold. Um, and so we're uh, increasing our reliance on a non-renewable resource to feed the globe's growing population, right? So we have to do something. Steps like looking at the problem uh, in a quantitative way. And so we, uh, we springboarded from uh, Dana Cordell's uh, phosphorus flow diagram that she published about 10 years ago. We modified it a little bit. And you see it here, and the arrows represent the mass, the annual mass of phosphorus flows through different areas of the global food system. So you start in the upper left with fertilizers, it goes into the agricultural system, and in the lower right, for example, you can see the quantitative amount of runoff into surface waters. Of course, averaged, right? And we know that there are uniquenesses geographically that are very important. But then STEPS looks at this and we say, okay, what can we learn about the system and where we can really make inroads, right, through innovations or, or interventions? On the left, I've identified in this uh, green arrow the fact that there's a mass imbalance. I'm an engineer, right? I look at this type of thing. So a lot goes in, very little comes out. It points to legacy phosphorus or lost phosphorus. Um, on the bottom, we can see losses to surface waters um, and the, the pointing to the wastewater treatment plants. But then I think importantly is how humans um, are, are intertwined, but also define this entire diagram. So the blue arrow, arrow points to us, a little bit comes in, a little bit goes out, but our decisions affect this entire flow diagram, right? So it's not just our individual decisions with respect to diet, but it's also policy that we spoke a lot about yesterday as well. So this diagram is gonna be a subject of the road mapping process that's gonna be described later, which is why I spent a little bit of time on it. Um, I like thinking about what I eat and the impact that me as an individual, I as an individual have on the phosphorus flows. And so uh, in thinking about the amount of phosphorus required to grow the food that I eat, um, I think a lot about this paper by Genevieve Metzen. On the left, you can see a bar chart that uh, reflects the relative amount of phosphorus required to yield certain types of food products, right? And so if you eat a lot of red meat, there's a lot of phosphorus required in order to provide that red meat to you. Uh, on the other hand, on the far left of that plot, you can see vegetables and fruit, right? Being a really low quantity. And so you as an individual, you may look at this and you may say, well, I'm gonna go vegan and I'm gonna help solve this problem, right? But one way to express the wickedness of this problem, and there are probably multiple ways of doing this, is to say, yeah, you can make that decision and that's great. You really significantly affect the upstream aspects of this, but you also increase the burden to wastewater treatment plants. And so this really emphasizes to us, we need to be thinking about this as a system, which I think most of you already knew, but it reinforces that. Um, and so the last slide was about the individual, uh, but we all know that this is a global problem and you don't need graphs to point this out, but I really like the one on the left. We spoke, we saw yesterday a lot about the runoff into the Gulf of Mexico and the algal blooms there, but we have coastal dead zones throughout the world, right? So it's a global problem. On the right, you can see the uh, anthropogenic uh, phosphorus loads in river basins being more than what the river basin can assimilate naturally. And so this is a, a imminent challenge that we have to deal with everywhere. How is population gonna affect this? So we know that there's gonna be significant population growth in the next 25 years. You'll see that STEPS has a 25 year vision, but where is that population growth, right? Um, the red, line that's kind of flat after 2025 is Europe and North America, All right? So we need to fix the problems that we have here, but if we don't look beyond our borders into where population is increasing, we're gonna have a new problem 25, 50 years out, right? And so a significant amount of the population growth in the next 25 years is gonna be in Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look even beyond 25 years, this just explodes. And so it's important that what we define in terms of geographically centric roadmaps, whether it be the UK, Europe, or North America, or the US, also takes into account how these types of interventions project into these other spaces, right? 
Okay, one other thing that uh, helps set the stage for the way that STEPS thinks about how we should tackle this problem, and that relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think one of the best statements that I've ever heard um, about involvement of diverse individuals in creating innovative solutions is from Shirley Malcolm, who spent many years, if not decades, at the National Science Foundation, and she's uh, most well known for her understanding and impact on broader impacts of research. And so she's gave a number of testimonies and speeches. Uh, one recent one there is highlighted on the right at the National Academies in DC, but the one on the left that I've quoted actually comes from a testimony to Congress where she says that uh, we're beginning to understand that research and education uh, cannot be excellent unless they're inclusive, that the lenses of diverse people bring to scientific research and discovery improve the inputs and the outcomes. So this is an absolute necessity in terms of who we engage in, as stakeholders in helping us understand the problem and help define solutions. And I was inspired, I am on Twitter, so you can find me on Twitter, um, but I was inspired by seeing on there reference to an RTI article that came out recently, and RTI International is one of our partners in STEPS, and they're also uh, conducting the activity later today on road mapping. Uh, but this came out of RTI Press, the need for a diverse environmental justice workforce. And so here it said that active engagement of those who are most impacted by these harms and inequalities is absolutely necessary. A diverse workforce that reflects the experiences of the affected communities needs to be involved, right? So like Jim said earlier, we're in this room, we're bringing our own perspectives, but there's perspectives outside of this room that are also key to developing the roadmap, and that's something that Carrie's gonna address as well. So um, we described to the National Science Foundation from an academic perspective, admittedly academic, that phosphorus sustainability challenges transcended 17 orders of magnitude in link scale. And I love this because I work in nanotechnology. Ross said that about me, right? So in teaching nanotechnology to students, we often say, okay, what is the effect of link scale? So here we know that we need to be working at atomistic link scales, sub nanometer on the far left. We need to be working at link scales at which humans interact with technology. So you think farm scale, wastewater treatment plant, watershed, but then also global and regional scales, thinking about policy, ecology, macroeconomics, and, and whatnot. So all of these important are important, but they can't work in isolation, right? They have to work together. And that is the innate, what I think is the, the innate challenge in phosphorus sustainability is combining all of these different perspectives and coming up with really tractable solutions. And so uh, the National Science Foundation, a year before we wrote our proposal, came out with 10 big ideas. And one of their ideas was to grow so-called convergence research. And we thought, oh, okay, we've sealed the deal here, right? So NSF wants to invest in complex problems that require highly interdisciplinary approaches. And so this is one reason why STEPS is described as a convergence research center. So what is STEPS? STEPS is a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center, or STC. Speaking with some folks yesterday, and I said, uh, before steps, if you were asked the question, which federal agency would sponsor a phosphorus sustainability center, you wouldn't say NSF. Right? You'd say USDA, you'd say EPA, something like this, right? But we ended up winning this through the National Science Foundation, and that has a, a couple very important implications. Um, so one is the focus on basic research, right? We're absolutely interested in translation and applied research, but we want to ask fundamental questions, right? Um, and so a description of, of what an STC involves is up here. It's an initial award for 25 million over five years with the expectation of renewal for another five years and expectation of sustainability beyond that. Um, and STCs are required to have this notion of convergence research and they cross all different areas of the National Science Foundation, including social and behavioral sciences. So uh, I showed the map of steps before. We have 10 institutions. One thing that I've highlighted on this map on the left are what I previously told you were triple bottom line scenario sites. Physical sites where we have geographic boundaries, where we have stakeholder, specific stakeholder narratives, right? And we can calculate phosphorus flows and think about intervention strategies. Um, on the right, just some bullets. I think I mentioned most of this before. One thing that I didn't mention is that we just started a year ago. So we're just starting year two of the center. 
Um, the projects that you'll see that are currently part of our research portfolio are, are initially two-year projects, but the research portfolio of steps evolves. And so your input is important in determining how we prioritize resources when the, within the center and what we go after in the future. And then this level of uh, research support, um, just so you know how this affects uh, the investigators. This supports about 40 senior investigators and about 40 uh, graduate students or postdocs, a lot of whom are actually here or who will be here at the SPS meeting in the next two days. So this is an important slide because this slide is going to be the defining vision for what we hope becomes the US-centric roadmap for phosphorus sustainability. And so what we proposed to the National Science Foundation was a 25-year vision informed by some of the phosphorus flow diagrams you saw before um, with a hope to facilitate a 25% reduction in our dependence on mine phosphates and a 25% reduction in losses of point and non-point sources of phosphorus to soils and water resources within 25 years. And one important word in this vision that I did not bold is facilitate. And you're going to see that today. We want to facilitate this through a road mapping process that involves stakeholders from throughout the world. Okay. Um, and so we, take, we took a close look, not just at the, the flow diagram that I showed you before, but uh, this diagram, which I think has been in at least one uh, prior presentation over the last day and a half, which shows uh, business as usual cases and then um, different areas where we can make inroads, right? Can we really achieve a 25% reduction in the things that I mentioned before, the inputs and the outputs. Well, there are a couple things that are big bars, and those are important for us in steps. So one is efficiency of agriculture, and one is reuse of P, for example, through manure. So these become focus areas of steps. On the downstream side, we also look at environmental pressure. And I loved reading this article by Marco Springman uh, from 2018, uh, where they do global, uh, global environmental modeling to determine the environmental pressures of P, N, and C, I think, so all three of them. So I pulled out the P data here. And you can see if we do nothing, there's going to be a 50% increase in our impact on the environment. We can all change our diets and go vegan, like I mentioned before, but that only curbs it a little bit because of population growth and the rise in affluence, it's not enough. Right. We can reduce food waste, which is, I think, yesterday described as a low-hanging fruit. That's great, but it's not enough. What we really need is improvement in technologies and management, right? which is what STEPS focuses on, but not just exclusively that, on the convergence of solutions across all of these different spaces. So we identified to NSF four starting points. This doesn't mean these are the research areas that we'll be pursuing in year 10. Uh, but initially, we wanted to focus on soil-bound phosphorus, on surface waters, on animal manure, and on human urine. And we spoke a lot yesterday about public policy. We saw work on surface waters. Um, STEPS goes beyond that to all of these different areas that you'll see presentations on over the next few days. Importantly, as I said, STEPS is a National Science Foundation Center, so we're interested in, in fundamental research, basic research, if you're familiar with technology readiness levels, TRL1, right? Um, and so we describe that on this, again, this admittedly academic quad chart of uh, different types of research activities. So we're seeking a, a search for a fundamental understanding, which is on the left, but while considering its use, its use inspired, right? So um, STEPS sits uh, squarely in the upper right-hand corner of this, the so-called Pasteur uh, quadrant. Importantly, STEPS is also a convergence research center. I mentioned convergence as an NSF big idea, and I mentioned that STEPS is a convergence research center with phosphorus sustainability as the vehicle. So uh, this, we take this to heart. Um, we have an expert here in the room, Christine Hendren, uh, who's established in the field of science of team science and integration of implementation science. And she helps us organize and integrate our ideas. We develop convergence informatics, and we have uh, Alexi, who's a postdoc in the room, working with Yara Yingling group. So this is something that they're spearheading. We involve stakeholder groups through a variety of different mechanisms. Today is one of them. And we use so-called convergence boundary objects, like the triple bottom line scenario sites that I mentioned before. So I showed you pictures of these sites on the, the map of steps. Um, if I could say anything more about them, I would say that they're real field test sites. 
So not only are we doing academic research, but we're also seeing how that translates into the field and understanding fundamental science questions associated with that, whether that's in the urban ecosystem and retrofitting buildings for recovery of human urine, or whether that's in rural uh, tidewater farmlands with, uh, with new, uh, new types of uh, plants, for example. So uh, we took this uh, link scale map where we said the challenges of phosphorus sustainability span 17 orders of magnitude. And we said, gosh, if I have a graduate student trying to conduct a dissertation where they have to think across 17 orders of magnitude, they're going to get paralyzed. I don't know if any graduate students are in the room. I, you don't want this challenge, right? And so you need a working group where you can advance your ideas without being paralyzed by the breadth of the problem. And so we define these research themes. And so the research themes are color-coded. So on the left, we have the material scale research theme one. Uh, which discovers and develops new inorganic, organic, and bio-inspired materials. In the middle, we have this research theme that focuses on scales at which humans interact with technology, which evaluates the viability of technologies for recovering phosphorus from complex waste streams and optimization of soil properties. And we have research theme three, which uses a systems level approach to evaluate how human intervention, policy intervention, and technology adoption could affect phosphorus sustainability. And you actually heard from uh, one of the former leads of Research Theme 3 yesterday, Anna Marshall and Justin Baker, you're going to hear from in a little bit. I guess that maps to this next slide just to show you some faces. So some of these folks are in the room, so feel free to interact with them to learn uh, a little bit more about the, the uh, in-lab research activities, in-field research activities, uh, in-silico research activities. Uh, Jan Ginzer's over there, Owen's in the back, Justin's here, uh, and Ross and Paul are here. So uh, I mentioned the year one research portfolio was defined, and this is the research portfolio that extends into year two. Um, I believe everyone has access to these slides or will have access to these slides, so you're certainly uh, willing, to, you're certainly able to photograph them. We also have uh, public abstracts available for each of these projects if you want at least one level deeper understanding of what's going on within these certain areas. But these projects are color coded by the lead of the project. So each of these projects is interdisciplinary, but it's led by someone who's established in a discipline that's specific to a research theme. And so for example, Paul Westerhoff is over here, leads a project on standardizing and advancing phosphorus analytics. Owen Duckworth in the back leads project 2.3 on developing phosphide as a sustainable next generation fertilizer and Justin Baker at 3.5 on systems modeling decision support and road mapping in which you're gonna participate today. Um, it's impossible to dive deep into all of those different areas and tell you all of the exciting things that are going on. I mean, that would really require like an annual meeting of steps, right? So um, what I can do though is I can point you to some recent publications as sort of successes of outputs that, um, that, are, that are recent. So in the upper left, we have a, a paper, and I think four of the authors are actually here, about uh, hazardous spills at retired fertilizer manufacturing plants. That was one of the first publications that came out of steps. In the upper right, this is Trevor Boyer's work on uh, recovery of phosphorus from human urine. In the lower left, uh, plant science research by uh, Ruben Ray and Alvarez. Um, and uh, I'm not a plant scientist. I would love to play in that space, but Ross Cezani will answer any question you have about that paper. Uh, and in the lower right, uh, the challenge of non-reactive phosphorus mechanisms of treatment and improved recoverability using electro-oxidation. So that's a very comprehensive review paper and the preprint is available online and Brooke Mayer is, is here today. Uh, one other final thing about STEPS, um, I mentioned on one of the opening slides that STEPS has a headquarters presence in the Plant Sciences Building at NC State. And this is just a fabulous space. So when, if you're able to go over there on Thursday for the poster session, the building will be open and you can either explore the space yourself or, or any of the STEPS folks would be happy to take you around. But it's this amazing uh, location where we coexist with a lot of other interdisciplinary projects. So everyone is kind of doing this out of the box thinking, trying to get out of our academic disciplines and, and working in new ways together. So I, I look forward to you seeing that. We get asked a lot about um, how industry can engage with us. And today is important because you're stakeholders and we need your input into the road mapping. But there are many other ways that industry can get engaged. So for example, you can participate in a technical working group uh, through Matt and Kara. 
You can provide input to STEPS faculty leading projects and proposing new projects. You can go up to their poster and you can tell them they're doing it all wrong. You can support new research projects to amplify or leverage the STEPS research portfolio. If there's one aspect of STEPS that's really interesting to you and we want to think about taking a basic science project and turning it more into an applied project, let's do it. And of course, if you win the Powerball, you can provide a gift to help STEPS uh, advance its mission and vision in ways that complement the NSF support. For example, graduate student fellowships. You can help us diversify the pipeline of, of, of the future workforce. All right. So. Um, Finally, I was asked to, to tee up this road mapping process. And in order to do that, I'm going to go back to two things that I presented before. The first is the vision. 25 years, 25% reduction in inputs. That's uh, human dependence on mine phosphates. 25% reduction in outputs. That's losses to soils and surface waters. Um, and we can look at the business as usual case. We can look at published literature. We can look at uh, step-specific diagrams like the PFLOW diagram. And we can say, how can we get there? And importantly, one of the first things that Kerry and his team at RTI did to kind of make this more tangible, more tractable, um, was to say, OK, how can we divide this up into topics that eventually can become tables? <laughs> and uh, so what they've done is they've said, OK, we start this process of mining and fertilizer production. We go into animal and crop production. We have natural resource management uh, challenges and opportunities, the human-centric consumption aspect of this, and then the waste aspect of this. So I think Anna Marshall yesterday was the first to, to foreshadow what was coming today. And so within each of these spaces, there are opportunities for interventions and innovations, and that's really what we want to get our hands on today, is how does that play out in achieving a 25-year vision of these 25% goals? And ultimately, what they're hoping to do is to increase uh, recyclability, increase the circularity of, of, uh, of the phosphorus flow system. And so we invite you. These are Kerry's words. Let me get them out here. This is where we put you to work. We want to ask you to share in our vision for the next few sessions. Steps from co uh, sorry, colleagues from Steps will work with you through a series of activities to help create an industry roadmap to achieving the Steps vision. As a convergence research center, what we hope you've seen is that we think of the problem holistically, and we want you to think of it holistically as well. So, how might we achieve a vision for phosphorus sustainability? What new research and development or policy interventions could best move us in that direction? What stakeholders must be on board, including those in the room and including those not in the room right now? And so uh, I'm going to pass this off to Carrie or Justin in just a minute to, uh, to facilitate that process. But I do have one more thing. And that one more thing is this is challenging. I think all of you working out there, whether you're in industry or academic circles, you recognize it's really challenging. And uh, I, I just, sorry, I have to put this out there, Steps folks. Um, when we went up to NSF, we said, we acknowledge this is challenging. This is a moonshot program. Okay? And so in the words of John F. Kennedy, we express the challenges of phosphorus sustainability, which is to say we don't do it because it's easy, but because it's hard, because we really want to make a difference. right? And that takes energy, and it takes time. It takes waking up and being here at 8 AM. <laughs> um, and it's going to serve and organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, and we intend to win. So this is. This is the team as uh, assembled in June of, uh, of 2022. It's constantly evolving, uh, but I just want to acknowledge um, their significant contributions to what's going on, hopefully some of which you'll see in the SPS meeting in the coming days. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. A very, very comprehensive, interesting presentation. Uh, the role of the industry, because you mentioned on one slide that three or four industry partners have already, uh, uh, let's say, uh, joined uh, at least with kind of space uh, renting in, in your campus or in your center. Uh, are they also uh, uh, partners in research, uh, particularly thinking of enzymes, for example, that could reduce uh, the pea consumption in feed and uh, consequently the excretions. That could be a very interesting contribution. Yeah, no, uh, it's a great question. So on one of the slides, I did reference some partners that are engaged with STEPS. So they're indirectly engaged with STEPS right now. They're actually partners of the Plant Sciences Initiative, and they're co-located in our building, and we interact with them regularly. 
Steps does not yet have a formal industry partnership program, but we are in a lot of conversations uh, with a, a lot of folks out there about what that should look like and what industry, what different types of companies and businesses want from us, right? Because it's not always the same. Um, we're about to form a nascent industrial advisory board to help us you know, codify what we think should be a long-term industry engagement plan. Um, the other thing I would add is that we've assembled uh, 40 leading researchers. These obviously aren't the only leading researchers in the US. They were just the ones that allowed us to win the STC. Um, and so you as a, an external entity, if you're from a, a company and you want to engage with us, I mean, there's a number of different ways in which you can do that. Uh, so we already have this cross-institutional collaboration. We already all speak the same language. And so uh, we hope that we can catalyze and accelerate so real solutions that uh, that help industry in some way. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I learned from your presentation that um, Africa is going to be quite um, impactful uh, going forward on um, phosphorus um, consumption and maybe loss. So I wanted to find out that um, going by the pathway you've designed um, through steps to walk through the problems. Are there plans in the way to deploy these strategies to Africa? <laughs> yes, um, and I would uh, look to everyone in the room to help us do that in the future. I think today is gonna be a very interesting exercise to help develop, again, what I said is, is admittedly a US-centric uh, roadmap. You know, we have, uh, roadmaps or at least uh, published advice uh, for different uh, geographical regions of the world. Um, I think we don't yet have that for the U.S. Um, and although it is admittedly U.S. centric, it should uh, be inspired by what's going on globally, right? Because uh, the innovations that we create here in the U.S., we want to be able to translate into useful innovations in Africa, for example. Um, STEPS has started uh, really great conversations with UM6P and uh, some Moroccan uh, counterparts. And, you know, we're hoping that uh, through collaboration across all of these different spaces, SPA, uh, European Sustainable Phosphorus uh, Consortium, and, uh, and all of the folks in Africa that really have a vested stake in this, that, that we can make inroads um, in, in Africa in the future. I, I don't know if that was an adequate response, um, but... I hope that's where we can go. Another question came in, it says, is part of the research roadmap to expand convergence research? Example, use Tidewater research results to apply for a national CIG on farm trial grant opportunity. I'm gonna have to call on a phone a friend for that, Ross. <laughs> Who are you pointing? Luke. Is Luke in the room? Yeah. <laughs> well, while they're repeating the question, let me just add to the, the prior question about um, how all of this activity and these interests and this perspective map to the African space. You know, we, we were successful at winning what we think is the largest known research center in the world dedicated to phosphorus sustainability, but it's only initially a five-year grant for 25 million. This problem is so much bigger than that, right? So the types of challenges that you see in Africa and other spaces in the world are really going to require a new effort that builds upon, you know, what we're doing here in this space. Luke? Yeah. Uh, the question is about using the, for example, results that you are having Tidewater Research Station to apply for other national grants like CIG uh, grant. And uh, yeah, so we have these results from Tidewater. They are public available. Uh, and uh, we have uh, one paper that is coming out at Science Society of American Journal this month, about the last two years. And the results, uh, we can use this to put as a, a starting point for these other grants for other agencies and, the, for example, the CIG grant. Do you get the sense that industry is excited or reluctant about reducing fertilizer sale, sales to support visions like 25 and 25? Well, once again, I wish I could phone a friend and pass off the mic to all of the industrial representatives in the room, but 
you know, I think that uh, there is a, a if it doesn't already exist, there's a significant industry, interest by industry in sustainability, right? And so, uh, yes, I think they're interested in not just participating in these conversations, but actually making you know tangible inroads on on these types of things. But that's my academic perspective. The question's probably not best posit uh, sent to me, but yeah, if if I may add here, yes, uh, yes, and no. <laughs> because because uh, uh, industry cannot be happy with the target of reducing the sales volume. I mean, this is not uh, aligned to our capitalistic uh, economic system. So uh, if we don't find, and I think this is part of, of such projects, uh, different models how uh, revenues can be generated for businesses, uh, that are not generated by the use and sales of commodities and, and materials, uh, we will not see a happy, happy industry uh, uh, following uh, of our activities. So uh, I think it has, an, uh, let's say, this different uh, additional challenge in it. the comment of Ludwig, uh, my point of view is that uh, the industry is looking for uh, being sustainable, including, uh, of course, the uh, phosphate industry. Now, reducing uh, the target of reducing consumption, uh, I don't think that the, the industry is against. Now, fixing the number, 25-25, I don't know if there are some fundamentals in, in order to fix these numbers, but definitely the, what you are seeing uh, worldwide is that the phosphate industry is uh, making a lot of effort in order to be sustainable for the long term. But the 25-25, uh, I wonder if there are some uh, fundamentals for, for it. Yeah, we've, we've heard a lot of numbers, and I'll just quote, uh, I think Ludwig uh, yesterday was saying uh, a goal of 50% reduction in losses over a period of what, 10 years or something like that? Yeah, so uh, that's the European goal, right? So uh, I think we're a bit more conservative over here on this continent. Um, is it the EPA, or Justin, I don't know where you're at, the EPA or USDA that had the 30% reduction goal by, was it in 30 years or, or, or whatnot? So, uh, we came up with 25 and 25 before we heard those numbers, just based upon the flow diagram. So it's hard to predict innovations. In fact, you cannot predict discoveries, right? That's the nature of discoveries. But you can work in the right spaces, and that's what STEPS wants to do. You know, where in that phosphorus flow can we really make a difference? And that's where we want to invest the resources that we have, right? Regardless of the risk. You know, all of this may fail, right? All of the research may fail because... Uh, innately, when you're doing uh, technology readiness level one research, um, you know, we may not achieve the discoveries that, that we're aiming for, but uh, we've got a great team and we don't think that's the case. Um, and we need input on, uh, again, looking at the phosphorus flow diagram, where can we make a 25% um, uh, change? So in 25 years, you know, we'll look back on this and say, well, we didn't achieve 25 and 25. Maybe it was, maybe we achieved 30 and 25. Maybe we achieved 10 and 25. But at least we need something aspirational, right? Something ambitious. So it's an ambitious, aspirational vision that helps guide where we invest resources and energy and time in the next five to 10 years. So. Yeah, so I was going to make a comment uh, to beg to differ on Ludwig's uh, comment on industry's reaction. Well, Jim pointed out we have a phosphate mine right here in North Carolina, the Aurora mine, and I think it's a nutrient uh, phosphate plant now. Uh, so for fertilizer production or making phosphoric acid out of the rock, you've got five tons of waste for every ton of product you make. So you've got Florida with you know 27 impoundments of phosphogypsum. Uh, is STEPS research looking at integrating with the fertilizer, the production industry, uh, to maybe recover and reuse that, uh, that waste product? I, I think then you would get industry on board because then you're making the fertilizer production more efficient. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's a really great point. So. Um, there's, there's great opportunities in that space. Our year one research portfolio doesn't include that because we don't have experts in that area. What I saw when I visited Morocco recently was a significant interest in academic research in, in uh, phosphogypsum and the mining area. And I think that's why we need to collaborate with, uh, with other folks, right? Because again, the first statement in that vision is to facilitate, right? Not to achieve by ourselves. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, we appreciate the problem and we think it needs addressed um, and it may become part of the steps research portfolio in the future. Great presentation. I'm Carl Lyon. I'm from Nutrient. I'm actually going to the Aurora mine tomorrow to visit. Uh, Can I come? You, I'll bring you back some fertilizer. Um, <laughs> have you modeled out what a 25% reduction in fertilizer would do to fertilizer price and availability globally? I'm again going to phone a friend. He's over in the corner, Justin Baker. <laughs> so thanks, um, Justin Baker. So uh, to answer that question, we are working on kind of stylized policy scenarios using our integrated Ag and land use systems models to try to quantify some of the opportunity costs of um, you know command and control oriented restrictions on fertilizer use, both P and N, um, in the U.S. context. Um, we've started some global modeling work recently. Um, the the costs are pretty high, as you can imagine, for a regulatory restriction like this. If we're to just impose a 25 percent direct reduction on P fertilizer without making that up from other sources. Um, that causes quite a bit of a um, uh, shifting in land use and kind of agricultural crop mix strategies. Um, and so, so yes, we're working on it. Uh, but more importantly, we're working on integrating some of these alternative interventions, policy mechanisms, technologies, um, alternative fertilizer sources into our models to, to better reflect a portfolio of interventions for hitting these long-term targets. 